Hi, I'm Patrick Sullivan. This is Recurring Insight, and for this episode, I'm going to be talking about Goblin Guide. So Goblin Guide is one that is near and dear to me as a competitive player. It's something that I play with a lot, and um, a lot of the uh, decks I've played the most over the last close to 10 years at this point have included the card. But it is a case study in sort of the efficiency of design, not efficiency speaking to mana cost or power level necessarily, but efficiency saying speaking to the distribution of all things going on with the card, sort of gearing you towards a homogenous style that is not particularly interesting. And for this reason and a few others, I don't think Goblin Guide is a particularly good design. When discussing a card's power level, often the level one analysis is discussing reef just sort of abstractly how powerful is the card. And sort of adjacent to that, sort of a subset of that, is its efficiency. Most designs do more than one thing or have more than one characteristic. And so efficiency in this context speaks to how efficiently distributed is the card's characteristics. Does it give you multiple characteristics that very obviously synergize with one another? or is it disparate stuff? There is room for both in the game and Magic has examples of both class of card being powerful, but often the super efficient designs promote a very homogenous style of deck construction. Whereas the inefficient ones that are powerful encourage sort of an array of different things to try to optimize all the different disparate characteristics that a card has. An example of this, a comparison to make is Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath, versus Broxa, Titan of Death's Hunger. Both very powerful cards. And if you wanted to shorthand it and say, well, Uro is just more powerful, that's sort of the thing that's going on. It's not unreasonable, but I think that is a shallow analysis. Uro is an incredibly efficient design. One of the most efficient designs of all time. The combination of mana ramp, card drawing, and life gain synergizes very cleanly. It gives you the mana and cards to play your more powerful stuff, and the life to cushion you against aggressive decks so you have enough time to deploy your extra resources. And that's why when Uro gets going, the game is often not really that interesting because there's no angle of attack left for the opposing player. You're not gonna be able to outcard them, you're not gonna be able to outmana them, and you're not gonna be able to damage race them. And so Uro provides this inevitability and a lot of that has to do with the efficiency of its stuff. Compare that to Kroxa, also a powerful card, Maybe not quite as powerful, but the distribution of stuff here is way, way less efficient. You're talking about a card that makes you discard. So there's a natural cap on what that could do. People get empty handed. Sometimes they have cards in their hand that are not that valuable. That's just abstractly less valuable of a commodity than drawing cards. But the real important thing is part of what Kroxa does converts into a ton of damage because it's attacking us at 6-6. And as someone gets empty handed or they're trying to protect their key spells, they're often taking additional damage from the trigger. And it's really rare that you want to be playing this late game card that primarily converts into damage. So Kroxa has some inefficiencies baked in. How this pertains to Goblin Guide is Goblin Guide is one of the most efficient designs of all time. It's bizarre to describe it that way because it has a little bit of text and then a long drawback. So how can something that's primarily defined by its drawback be efficient or inefficient in this respect? But a 2-2 haste for one red is way, way above curve. It's, I think you should just call that, that's just a two mana card. And that's a two mana card that would show up in, in standard a considerable amount of the time if it was just legal in perpetuity. The drawback that the card has, though, like ostensibly significant, you would not play a lot of cards that had a drawback that extreme on an attack trigger is mitigated by the fact that the card pays you off for killing someone ex extremely quickly. And because the design is that efficient, it promotes a really homogenous construction of deck. And not surprisingly, Goblin Guide shows up a ton around Lava Spikes, Boros Charms, and similar cards, subsidizing a deck like Burn, with a card as powerful as Goblin Guide isn't the worst thing in the world. I do wish the recipe was just a little bit more interesting. Something like Monastery Swift Spear, though very powerful too, perhaps more powerful in the aggregate than Goblin Guide, that's a more interesting puzzle. The timing of the cards, what order you want to play things in, 
uh, sequencing, bluffing. There's a better game going on there. Whereas Goblin Guide is just a brute force way of killing people as quickly as possible in mono red or burn style strategies. The card I love as a competitive player, a card I certainly had uh, a fair bit of, you know, tournament success with and something I'm nostalgic for, but really representative of some of the pitfalls of making really efficient designs. So again, that was Goblin Guide, and this is Recurring Insight. A couple things to do from here, make sure you're subscribed to the Starcy Games YouTube page so you can get notified when this and other content is uploaded to the page. Throw a like up there as well. And any card you want me to go through, again, give to the comment section. I get to it eventually. And no more comments about the hair, seriously. You're, you're right now watching a Magic the Gathering video on a YouTube page. I'm gonna put dollars to donuts that you might let yourself go a little bit in the pandemic too. And I got no one to impress.